Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much. Well, I'm very happy to be here, and thank you all for coming. Um, when I have an opportunity to give a talk like this, it means that I have the excuse to go research all this material for you instead of just for me. And it really would be a little selfish just for, just for me. I get to share it. So I'm happy about that. And I'll tell you my agenda here. The underlying motive I have is to encourage you to explore the same sources that I've been exploring and, and read this information for yourself. I just hope that it's, it's interesting enough to you that you want to go check it out for yourselves because it's, it's incredible and not that many people really are aware of these sources. So I'm going to try to introduce you. Uh, and now, there are various um, introductions in the, in the books and I've had an introductory talk to some of these um, subjects that we'll talk about here today. So I'll be starting somewhere in the middle on some of these topics. But the talks are ending up on YouTube these days, so hopefully if you want to go back and recap something, you can look it up there. I always start the talks with an exercise. It has to do with consciousness, because what Hylozoics, which is what Pythagoras taught long ago, and what, what Henry T. Lawrence, the Swedish philosopher, is reintroducing, what he is saying is that the meaning of existence, the whole plan and purpose, is tied up with the evolution of consciousness. That's the point of it, is that consciousness grows through the use of these bodies that we have, the experiences that we have. There's a lot further to go than we might even be able to imagine. I'm so, we certainly can't imagine. But we have an amazing gift just to have the consciousness we have, and we've worked hard to get it. According to Hylozoics, we've actually struggled through, well, maybe struggle is a, puts the wrong light on it, but it's been a lot of work to get here. We've had to actually make our way through the mineral kingdom and the vegetable kingdom, the animal kingdom, all those kinds of consciousness to reach human consciousness. And the most interesting thing about human consciousness that really distinguishes it from animal consciousness the prior is that we can be conscious of consciousness. So what I'm asking you to do in this introductory exercise is to pay attention to your attention. Consider what you are paying attention to, what thoughts, where the attention is is where the self is. To be fully self-conscious and not, you know, worried about your appearance, conscious of your consciousness as true self-consciousness, that's a big step forward, really. We don't do a lot of it. Usually we're controlled, really, by automatic thinking that's not conscious thinking at all. It's responsive, reactive thinking that says, well, I've always done this. You don't even make that statement to yourself. You just do the same pattern of behavior. That gets us in trouble. It, we say the things that we wish we hadn't said. We get mad at people, and if we'd thought about it, we wouldn't have. We, that's automatic thinking. So what I'm encouraging with this exercise is just take a moment to choose where your consciousness lies. And you're here. Be all the way here, too. I, I really I look forward to really connecting with your consciousness in this talk. Now, if I record Tolle, I could just be quiet for a few minutes and everybody would be fine with that. But uh. <laughs> I don't know if I can pull that off. But just, just go within and, and reach for that source of consciousness that's, that's you. So, we're going to talk about history. First, we'll talk about the past. History is a view of the past. It's interesting that it brought Eckhart Tolle, because he's the one that really emphasizes this point, that the only thing that exists is now. The past is not a place you can go. It's not a thing. All that exists is what exists in this moment. And the past has its memories in this moment, but they exist now. The memories exist now. It has its disharmonies. Maybe we did something that set something out of balance. Well, the effects of that action still remain in the present. That's where they are. We can't actually, according to Hylozoics, go back and change the past. We can't alter the fact that events have happened. But an interesting way we can change 
what the past means now. And I think that's really important because so many of us struggle with memories of things that have happened and we spend time revisiting it and beating ourselves up about it, whatever it might be. What is happening, what, what has happened, has only participates in the present moment through its effects and its memories and things that are recorded. The effects, once they are put back in order, essentially fix the past. When there are no more consequences of a past action to be rectified, then the past can be released. There's no more reason to think about it again or to, we've learned what we need to learn from it when we've set things right. And the setting things right can happen now. It can, it's always available to be done because the only essence of the past that exists is in the present where we can change things. Everything in the present can be changed. It's kind of a philosophical concept, but for, it's helped me. Speaking of change, if we're going to talk about the past, we need to talk about time a little bit. Time, esoterics talks about time as a series of events. And when you think about it, if nothing actually happened at all, if everything simply stopped changing, there would be no time. How could there be time if everything was absolutely unchanging? So, another place, another mind stretcher more than anything else, I think, really, we, we have to deal with time in a very practical way in this, in this life. And as long as we're talking about the past, we have to touch on the future. It's, it's like the past in that it doesn't exist as a place you can go or a, a thing. Uh, it's not something that we can go alter. But it is, uh, it, it's not like the past in that we don't really know what's going to happen. Uh, I've gone into this in another talk that there really is no such thing as predestination. There's no turning of the gears that can predict exactly what will happen next because consciousness is thrown in the mix. And as human beings, we're continually choosing. We have free will. And we'll, we'll make the most unpredictable decisions at all times. <laughs> so not, not even the greatest divine mind can predict what, what human beings will do next. We're probably the hardest of all the beings to predict what we'll do next because we'll make the worst possible choice when offered a variety of them. <laughs> um, now on to history. It's always been interesting to me, but it's always been a little, it's not been satisfying. You know, reading it doesn't give me the feeling that I've actually, I can be sure about what I'm reading. And when you read in the esoteric books, they pretty much have the same statement to make that throughout history, you've got story after story made up by the people who have the power. And we just, we don't even have, you know, we have our glamorous ideas of the good old days. That's not history, you know. As much as we'd like to return to some fantasy about the past, the past has never been that lovely. Um, although, I'll mention something else about that later. We're not quite right about that. But being a historian, my gosh, what, what a job that must be to try to sort all this out. I'm not envious at all. The, a historian is somebody who's got to be an expert on the opinions of other people about the opinions of other people. So by the time you get through all of that, you know, you, you've got second and third-hand information. I mean, <laughs> Obama got himself in trouble the other day saying something about historians. <laughs> he said, but I promise you, folks can make a lot more potentially with skilled manufacturing or the trades than they might with an art history degree. Now, nothing wrong with an art history degree. I love art history, so I don't want to get a bunch of emails from everybody. He was <laughs> backpedaling as fast as he could there. He had to take an art historian to lunch, I think, to straighten it all out. <laughs> Um, but, you know, you look at the historian's job, what's he, what does he have for sources? He's got other historians' books that were written about other historians' books, like we talked about. If he's lucky, he's got some first-hand, you know, first-hand reports from people who have witnessed the events of history and can actually tell them what they saw happen, but then you put two people in the same place at the same time and they'll give you two completely different stories about what they saw. Um, you know, there is word of mouth that actually can be pretty good. It fascinates me to think of my, this time I spent with my 100-year-old grandfather, that he knew people that had been born in the 1830s, and that those people 
knew people that could have told them about the American Revolution. You know, that's only two hops to get to me from the American Revolution. So sometimes word of mouth can be a good way for information to travel. But ultimately, history is made of stories, and stories contain a lot of imagination. Um, I know from my own family's personal experience how a story can get made up that is actually completely false and yet is taken as history. I talked about this in my last talk, how my grandparents, the ones who um, I refer to my grandfather quite often, who's been a teacher of mine, but they had a retreat they built in north of Los Angeles back in the 30s. And some neighbor didn't know what was going on in there, and it was the you know, World War II time, and it was a very paranoid time. They, they were frightened, I guess, but they thought there might be Nazis living down in there. And I don't think she even told anybody until she happened to mention to her son, who thought, what a great story, and turned it into folklore of Los Angeles. And now if you look up a place called Murphy Ranch online, you'll discover that uh, this was a former abode of Nazis during World War II, something that's absolutely false, because it it's started by this one attention-seeking amateur historian, and, and now there's a big mess to straighten out, and I'm going to try to straighten out and write a book that actually talks about my family living there, my grandfather working for Douglas Aircraft during the war, not exactly a Nazi sympathizer, and my uncle serving in Patton's army. It's not a, uh, wasn't a Nazi enclave by any means, but the Los Angeles Times has even picked it up. These stories, people are so willing to believe the worst things. You know, that's, that's human nature. If you can make up a salacious story or a, a story that somehow um, is believably bad about somebody, that's the favorite kind of story for people to believe. And in fact, if, if the real bad guys out there want to attack somebody, that's the easiest, least effort for them to do is to make up a, a, some nasty lie about somebody, about you know, what they have done to somebody. Spread that around, it takes no effort at all. People soak it right up and spread it around. It's just too easy. Unfortunately, history is full of that, and, and Lawrence, he says, history might just as well be the history of gossip. <laughs> Another thing that affects these stories of, that we get from history is powerful agendas. You know, uh, agendas not just of individuals or powerful uh, groups, but of entire countries. When you look at what history is being taught to Russian children, even after the end of the communist era there, I'm sure it's much more skewed toward the workers and the capitalist, you know, exploiters than American history is, and we're skewed the other way. So who's to say, you know, people are not being taught accurate history anyway because of these powerful uh, forces pushing it in one direction or another. Another thing about history is we don't have very much of it. Um, Vatsky. Blavatsky, where's her picture? She's here somewhere. Uh, oh. oh, there she is on the cover of the book anyway. She used to have a picture up above there too. Anyway, she founded the Theosophic Society and she wrote some fascinating books, Secret, The Secret Doctrine and Isis Unveiled and other things. And she talks about how Lao Tzu wrote 1,000 1, books and they're all lost. <laughs> She's able to ascertain things like that at least. Um, the Library of Alexandria in Egypt, vast library of all the great teachings of the Greeks and Pythagoras and all the people of the times, burned, sacked, looted, destroyed in every possible way by the rather barbaric um, Christian movement, actually. By, the end, by 391 AD, it had all been destroyed. Interestingly, the Vatican supposedly has some hidden documents that I would like to see. Um, <laughs> Lawrence, he says that they have documents from the original Pythagoreans, you know, from 600 BC, that would shed a lot of light on what they actually thought back then. What's, what they really taught, there is no, no record out there that archaeologists are aware of. So, and then even if, um, you know, we do find things, here's a quote from Lawrence, what the archaeologists know about the Indian culture of some 50,000 years ago, the Egyptian of 40,000 years ago, the Peruvian of 15,000 years ago, or even that of ancient Greece 12,000 years ago. And he's considering these as recent cultures. 
We'll get into the ones that go back further than that soon. Another thing that, that is a problem with history is how we're surrounded by media that is insulating us from it. You know, what will this decade be called someday? The, the 20 teens, something like that. And what will that mean to people? You know, in the middle of the 60s, nobody knew that they were living in the 60s. <laughs> now, as we think of the 60s, later on, that got applied to the era with all of its somewhat stereotypical ideas. But, but they were watching, you know, they had their Marlboro commercials on TV all the time. They were surrounded by media bombarding them, just like now. You know, it's not history that the Game of Thrones is about to start up again, but that's what we're hearing about. You know, the day-to-day -day trivialities are what are flooding in on us. And if we, it, it, the, the reporters don't have time to go dig into things anyway, tell a big story. All they've got time to do is get that story out there quick. And if you've ever been involved in a news story and actually that you knew what was really going on and read about it, then you would know that they rarely get things right at all. So trusting the media is a tricky business such as the Nazis in Los Angeles story, twice in the Los Angeles Times. But of course, history is valuable. It's hard to say how valuable when we don't trust it much, but one area where history is accurate is that it's a history of some pretty barbaric things human beings have done. That's clear enough. For the last, you know, all the history we've got is a history of conquest and bloodshedding and awful suppression of people's thoughts and freedoms. And that is unfortunately all too accurate. If we learn something from that, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be so much of that. We apparently don't learn much from history because we do keep repeating that. And when we keep, when, uh, when a powerful leader starts a war in another country in order to unite the people of his country behind him, you would think somebody would learn, but uh, we had George W. Bush just doing that recently. You know, that's no, that's no learning from history, it, apparently, in, in government form. We've been doing the same thing over and over again. I, it, you know, talking about sources of um, historical information. Oh, wait, I, I should mention about in the value of history that you actually can read some very interesting history of this country. Um, Howard Zinn, in his book, A People's History of the United States, it's not a cheerful read because it's really the dark side of U.S. history, but things that I had no idea went on are described in great deal there, detail there, even reviewing the Watergate years that I thought I was here for. You know, I thought I knew what had happened pretty much. So much more was going on, and, and at this point, nobody could deny that he's got it right. There were indictments of corrupt officials left and right all over the country, and it was all swept under the rug to some degree you know, let's pardon Nixon, he's the only bad guy, and then we can move on. But nothing really changed. That was a very enlightening book. I do recommend it. Well, as long as I'm mentioning historical information, I should mention the worst source of all for historical information, which is religion. Religion is not a mental thing at all. It's a belief thing, and that's an emotional thing, and they don't even care that much if they have history right even though you could have been burnt at the stake not that long ago for disagreeing with the ridiculous histories that religions have provided. Um, for instance, uh, Lawrence says that uh, a great deal of the Old Testament or Jewish history is constructed out of Babylonian origin. The Babylonian captivity was the source of a lot of, of the teachings that got recycled. For instance, uh, one of the recycled things was Moses in the bulrushes. It's actually Sargon of Akkad, Sargon the Great is what he's called, who, who the story was really about originally, thousands of years before. Uh, it's carved on a tablet that they dug up not that long ago in, in Mesopotamia that shows Sargon of Akkad, who was born here, this, put in a basket of bulrushes and then sealed with pitch, and the whole story is very similar. So that story was recycled into the religious stories. I, I gave an earlier talk on Christianity and where a lot of that information came from. The, the New Testament side of the Bible was a creation of Eusebios, the, who's the compiler in um, Constantinople, or whatever, whatever it was called back then. And he worked with Emperor Constantine to 
construct something to base their religion on. But the whole Nicene Council that pulled together to create the origins of Christianity, only Emperor Constantine Eusebius could even read. So it was up to them to decide what the Bible was going to contain, and Eusebius felt like there was a gap in one area, so he wrote the Acts of the Apostles chapter himself, and selected very carefully through and edited everything that went in there for various reasons, such as a lack of sympathy for reincarnation. Constantine wasn't fond of the idea, so it was edited out of a number of different biblical areas. So, religion has been a huge force in, in shaping and distorting his, history, obviously, and, and I, we're, we're so fortunate, you know, if we have to thank the many martyrs who have freed us from the idea that, of being tried for heresy because you, you think the earth goes around the sun. Galileo really started the open war of science and rationality against religion, but there were so many martyrs that we were unaware of. So basically, when you look at this through the, through the lens of esoterics, one thing you see is that the scientists are struggling, the, the historians are struggling, they don't really have that much to go on in a lot of ways. Uh, what Lawrence, he says, is without esoteric knowledge, men are unable to account for past events, events. How would people be able to understand these events as they lack the knowledge of reality and life, of the law, of the purpose of life, of the powers that rule the world? When looking at historians trying to understand history is like looking at psychologists trying to understand the individual without taking into account reincarnation. Not only do individuals reincarnate, but all of humanity reincarnates. And the history goes back far further than, than scientists or historians are aware. Even in our own recent thou thousand, couple of thousands of years of history, we can see civilizations come and go. That's, that's, that's um, consciousness coming down into form in a way and then back out again like we see in reincarnation. If you want to read an interesting book about all this, I'm sure it's here in the library, Lives of Alcyone. Um, it, it covered, you can read both about the ancient civilizations and about one individual's incarnations. It's 48 lives of one individual. Do we have his picture up here? Krishnamurti. Um, 48 different lives. And it's fascinating because it, gives, it places him in the, in the cultures all along the way, from 70,000 years ago forward, with Zarathustra and with Buddha and with Pythagoras and all the great teachers. And interesting, especially interesting, is, is something about how when we reincarnate, it's with clans. We have very closely related souls that reincarnate again and again in different relationships to us. They, there's a weave. If you could look back, you could see these lives weaving together, having different relationships with each other. And, you can see that Alcyon, um, the name of Krishnamurti used throughout all these lifetimes, even though he had a different name in each lifetime, he had a different, he was married to a different person, he was female sometimes. Uh, this person that he was married to would be his father in another lifetime. Just to see that kind of inner weave of relationships is fascinating. And of course, he's, he's on hand for some of the great events of history. You know, Buddha being there, there he was with Buddha. That's fascinating. Zarathustra, you know. And if you're interested further in reincarnation, I, I've, the books by Joan Grant are very good. Return to Elysium, about ancient Greece. There's one about uh, her life in Renaissance Italy. Uh, one about her, Winged Pharaoh is about her life in ancient Egypt. And that's it's both enlightening in terms of learning about reincarnation and what a past life might be like, and also because it, if, you, if you are going to take what they're saying seriously as quite likely possible, then you're actually getting a fine window into those times that hasn't been passed through thousands of years. It's a direct experience of some individual in that particular period of history. It's fascinating to me. And if you're really interested in reincarnation, read Sylvia Cranston's book. It's around here somewhere too. But, uh, it's very scholarly and gives everything everybody thinks about reincarnation in the world today. And it's, um, she's had another book on H.P. Blavatsky that's very good too. 
So, you know, we, what, do we, what do we really got to work with when we look at history? Lawrence he makes the point again and again that we can't trust what we've been offered, that it's not, it's not accurate, it's controlled by so many other forces. He says that history is almost, almost as much as religion, history has deluded mankind. And it's written by the victors, you know, and religious, religious uh, institutions were the victors in the Piscean Age that we're just leaving, so they wrote the history. There's a quote from Hermann Goering of, of Hitler's inner circle. We will go down in history as its greatest statesmen or its worst villains. And it was absolutely true. They went down as the worst villains, but it could have gone the other way. And that's the only way it would have gone. You know, if the Nazis had won World War II, they would have been the greatest statesmen ever. And that's what all school children would have been taught. In contrast to religion, we have natural science now, at least. We have some improvements. And natural science is harder for, well, I was going to say, it's harder for a political institution to shout down natural science. It's based on experiments, et cetera. But look at global warming. It's amazing. <laughs> if somebody wants to throw enough money at something and introduce doubt into everyone's minds, you know, oh, well, there are some scientists who say it's different. Oh, that's enough. <laughs> From that point on, the press thinks fair and balanced reporting is this person says it, it's global warming isn't happening. He gets just as much attention as a representative of the 98% of the scientists who think global warming is real. So how are we going to make sense out of that? It's <laughs> looking at the esoteric history, natural science has got so much more to discover. And as Lawrence, he says, you know, they, they find something, they don't know what it is. And they say, hmm, okay. Animism, that's one of the first things they jump to, you know, the worship of animal spirits or something. And if that doesn't stick, then they, well, okay, um, fertility fetish item, <laughs> you know. That's, maybe they can make that one stick. It, but the, I think really, in general, scientists, if you press them, they will agree that they don't actually know. That's to their benefit, to their credit. So, um, archaeology with its 9,000 years, recorded history for 5,000 years, and history barbarianism. Well, here's the bright light from uh, esoterics about all this. It's not all horrible. It's been a dark age we've been in. It's been an age of barbarians, and that's what our history is chronicling. But it turns out that there is some history that we have that we don't believe that we probably should believe a little more. The history of the Great Flood and the huge civilization that existed before. And what Lawrence says about Atlantis is that it, it uh, was started 12 million years ago. The, the, there's a, just like human beings cycle in and out of incarnation, this is the great cycle of human um, kingdoms cycling in and out of incarnation. This, the root races is what they're called in, in theosophy and esoterics. That we're part of the fifth root race, the Atlanteans were the fourth root race. That they started um, that root race started coming in its incarnation 12 million years ago, and its home was a continent in the middle of the Atlantic, called Atlantis. Now, Lawrence is very specific about a few things. He says that the continent actually sank in a series of really horrific events um, 800,000 years ago, or 800,000 BC, slight difference, 200,000 BC, 75,000 BC, and the very last chunk of it, Poseidonis, the island of Poseidonis, went under in 9,564 BC and was the origin of all the flood stories that so many cultures have and was a horrific event in human history. It wasn't until I read about this um, that I understood certain dreams I had. I, I, I've had this dream more than once of being outside and kind of pastoral situation and in the distance seeing something huge across the horizon, something coming that just got bigger until it was towering. And the sense in the dream that it was, was that it, it was simply the end. It was complete destruction. And there was no need to be afraid or to run because there wasn't anything you could do about it. It was simply the end. And according to esoterics, I was one of very many millions of people who had the same experience. 
And more than once, actually, according to this research, that these big chunks of, of land had sunk many times. But 9,564 years ago, what the books say is that Poseidonis sank over a mile into the ocean overnight, or it was within hours. And of course, destroyed that civilization completely and triggered a tsunami that was 1,600 feet high. And when that struck the coast of Europe, of North America, what, you know, the coastlines were different then, but as it, it just wiped out all the coastal civilizations, and that was actually the intention of the event. It was time for that incarnation of humanity to end, and I'll go into why. But a 1,600-foot high tsunami, we've seen now what tsunamis do. When they sweep ashore, they destroy just about everything they hit, and then they sweep all the debris out to sea. And a, a one that high would go up the river valleys too. It would go up the, the Tigris and you know, the rivers in the Mesopotamia, it would go right up and take out civilizations up to quite a distance. So it was the end um, for that particular incarnation of mankind. It's, um, it's interesting what it's, the books say about Atlantis. It says that we are the Atlanteans reborn especially in America, that we've come back now, we're still actually very much an Atlantean consciousness. The main goal of the fourth root race, and each, each of our incarnations and each of humanity's incarnations has a particular goal. Um, the goal of the fourth root race was developing emotional consciousness. So um, it reached great full expression and was probably quite successful. We've, we're not working on that anymore. We're working on on getting our mental consciousness going to the degree in this root race where it can, it can rise above the emotional and kind of transcend the Atlantean consciousness. But we haven't done it yet. We're still very Atlantean in many ways. There's actually a sixth root race to come and a seventh, and that's the end of the cycle. Uh, the sixth root race far in the future is about unity consciousness. It's tied to the next level of consciousness beyond mental. Now, when I use terms like race, it's, it's, um, it doesn't imply any inferiority or superiority. Um, you know, if you've got an older brother and a younger brother, the fact that the one is older does not actually make him superior to the younger. And the fact that this one has come in with newer, newer ideas because he's younger does not make him superior. The root races are not superior to one another. Unfortunately, you've got groups like the Nazis who tried to take ideas like the Aryan race and things like that and, and make racial categories some kind of contest of superiority. But that's not the case at all. So we've got um, Atlantis to look at here. The history of Atlantis is fascinating. There's a book called um, Dweller on Two Planets. It was written in the late 1800s by a young boy in Wairika, California, who I think he was 13 when he started writing this, and it, it just poured through him. He didn't, there's no way he could have made this up. If you read the book, you'll see. Somehow he was almost an involuntary channel for this information. And he wrote a lot of wonderful stories about Atlantis. They don't, they don't fit into the same category as the Bailey books or the Theosophical books, but I suspect quite a bit of it is true. It's got pretty amazing uh, uh, resonance when you read it. But even from the, the, um, the main sources that I, that I get this information from, it talks about Atlantis having, you know, they weren't very mental beings. So they didn't have the ability to create a civilization like we have for what, for what it's worth. We've got a civilization. Um, they needed help. And the next kingdom beyond human is always there looking to help us. They have, uh, they're compassionate. They've gotten past all the human egoisms and separatism. They can look at us and with compassion guide if we're willing to let them. And that's what they did in Atlantis because the people weren't evolved enough to do without that anyway. So these, um, these very advanced beings incarnated into humanity, set up governments, institutions. They were the antediluvian kings, to use a poetic term. They, um, they introduced technology. There were flying ships that people could use. There were means to communicate at great distances. 
there were um, cities, well-planned out cities with mass transportation, with sanitation, um, their culture, when you've got 12 million years to work with, they had time to work a lot of things out. And they, they, of course, they had their golden ages that would rise and fall too. They had civilizations come and go. But what Lawrence says that in our paltry couple of hundred years that we've been putting together some decent art, well, maybe a couple thousand if you want to bring the Greeks in, um, that all of it could be lost to no net detriment to humanity's cultural heritage if you were to count in all of everything that was done in Atlantis. You know, they, they were masters of so many kinds of, of, of culture. They, of course, it's easier when you're led by enlightened beings. That's what we really lack, is leadership by enlightened beings. But what, the way that, that came to end is that mentality did develop in Atlantis. It was gradually developing. And, and by the time of Poseidonis, there were individuals who had developed a great deal of intelligence and decided that the power was what they wanted. That they were going to claim power however they could go about getting it. And we know that kind of personality, you know. They, we meet them in company meetings sometimes. We meet them all around, but we meet them trying to conquer the world in the terms of Napoleon or whoever. It happens all the time, unfortunately, but they were first to show up there in Atlantis. And as they developed their power, they realized that they could get the masses to follow them through manipulation and through promises, through promising them all kinds of things. Well, we'll set up a civilization that's much better than this, you know, the one that has justice in it. You know, <laughs> justice is a big nuisance. You know, we can set up something a lot better where you can, you, appealing to the individuals, to their desire for power. Well, they succeeded. And the fact is, the people that make promises that are absolutely ridiculous are the only people that we vote for now. So it's no wonder that they succeeded back then. They succeeded to the point where humanity chose them and the term that's used for these, uh, these individuals was the Lords of the Dark Face. Um, the Black Lodge is another name for the, that group. That's when it began. They um, actually did convince humanity of the time to follow them and to reject the leadership of the, of the spiritual elite that had been ruling and had been creating these golden ages for them. And that was really the beginning of the end of Atlantis. When it got to that point, they weren't too far away from that final cataclysm. Because what they did was they enslaved humanity. They made the promises, but their goal was to enslave the rest of humanity, keep them down at a low level that it didn't threaten them. And they waged horrible wars with the magical powers they had. They actually had powers that uh, were part of the reason for the submergence of Poseidonis, so that that knowledge of how to manipulate matter through magical, we'd think of it as magic, it's very actually scientific from some perspective, but they used that ability to wreak havoc and destruction across entire continents. Um, and anybody that incarnated into those times by the end of the Atlantean era had not much prospect at all to actually expand their consciousness or grow, and it became a dead end for humanity. If you, can't, if you don't come in with some opportunity to, to learn and expand your consciousness, then it's pointless. So that was one of the reasons for the eventual destruction of Atlantis. It, um, beyond even the, the teachers of humanity that come from the next kingdom beyond human, there's something, yet another concept out there that I can introduce, hopefully not to too much skepticism, the planetary government. That's the overall most evolved beings on the planet that are in charge of the destiny of millions of years of evolution. And look at races and humanity and all the kingdoms of Earth, kingdoms of Earth and straighten things out when they get really far out of whack. And they looked at this situation, and Lawrence has an interesting quote. He says, A small tilt at the Earth's axis, and the apple peel thin crust of the Earth breaks. And that, that method was used, and down went Poseidonis, and that was the end of that particular era of human history. Let's hope we can avoid that fate. So 
but the, the, what we learned in Atlantis is not completely lost. We, uh, one of the most advanced clans of people from Atlantis incarnated in ancient Greece. And they reintroduced a lot of the, the, you know, the golden mean and ideas about ratio and artistic harmony and the sculpture and art and drama. They reintroduced quite a bit of that and gave our, our new civilization a kickstart. They weren't particularly recognized for their contributions back then. Plato was one of them. Um, Socrates. So, uh, both Lawrence and Blavatsky have a good laugh at the idea that somehow humanity could evolve through an Iron Age and a Bronze Age and suddenly we have the Greek culture in a few thousand years. <laughs> that it really took millions of years for humanity to make the progress that was recapitulated by the Greek culture, reintroduced by the Greek culture. Uh, I don't know if this is true. My grandfather, who's been my teacher about these things, was quite certain that Atlantis was run by women. And he said, men have now had their turn, and it'll be women's turn again shortly. And it's actually, begin, the transition is taking place now. And I have to say, actually, I think it's probably a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so you might ask, why don't we see remnants of this great civilization if the last of it went down 11,578 years ago? That's, to this year, that's how long ago, according to Lawrence's dating. Well, as I mentioned, you know, you've got this tsunami scrubbing the coastlines. And then whatever ruins were left, sea levels have changed considerably. Scientists can show what the sea levels were back at those times. And 11,500 years ago, the sea level was 60 feet lower because that was the end of an ice age. 22,000 years ago, it was 130 feet lower. So that means these coastal ruins have been submerged and have been battered by ocean in the process of the sea levels rising and the Ice Age ending. As coincidentally, the Ice Age ended right there. That's a very critical time, 11,500 years ago. It really coincides with this sinking of Sidonis. It may be related, could have to do with polar ice relating to the tipping of the axis. I don't know. But um, the most advanced civilization of the time was on Poseidonis, and that's completely submerged or and possibly below the seafloor of the Atlantic, and it's 11,578 years ago, that's a long time. Any civilization that didn't build huge stone structures, there won't be a trace of it left. But you know, we don't believe it when we do see it, actually, if there are any big stone structures, and it appears that there very, very well may be. Uh, you can, there are huge stone slabs marching off into the sea in about 60 feet of water, I believe, off the Bahamas. In several places in the world, enormous and ancient stone structures have been found. Um, the ones in the Bahamas, there are people who have dated them to 12,000 years ago. I'm not quite sure how accurate that is. But there are also huge fitted stones in Siberia that weigh hundreds of tons. And there's no, no one has any idea how such huge stones can be moved, even now. So there are mysteries to be solved out there and no scientist will touch them with a 10-foot pole. So when will they be solved? No one, scientist wants to be tainted with the idea that they're investigating Atlantis. Or I mean, this is where science kind of blows it. They, they think that they know that how humanity got started, and it's this very short little arc of incredibly rapid intellectual development. And since they're so certain about that, they're not really willing to accept ideas that civilization can go back much further. And that's unfortunate because the evidence does appear to be there. Supposedly the pyramids in Egypt are also much older than, uh, than scientists think. So let's go back even further. About 18 million years ago, according to esoterics, our current dense human form was fully established. That was at the time of the human incarnation called Lemuria. And that was a continent in the Pacific. It was also, it also went down, had the similar situations where humanity was just simply, had reached a stagnant point where it wasn't going to pull out of it. And the destruction was actually a, a good way to restart things. Then people could reincarnate into new, fresher cultures. It, um, 
it was riddled with venereal disease by the end, the population of Lemuria, which is kind of an interesting thing. The, this, this, I mentioned taking physical form. Apparently, one of the dynamics of getting our rather incorporeal selves to take dense physical bodies and become like we are now, sexuality helped anchor people in their bodies, and it was very much encouraged. It was an incentive to actually get into your body so you could participate in you know, the male-female dynamic. And um, that, of course, everybody got carried away with that, we can guess. We kind of evidence of that problem still. And um, syphilis arose and was the scourge of Lemuria through a lack of inhibition, when it was really pretty prudent to be more inhibited back then. They, they didn't manage it. And interestingly enough, cancer, it says in the books, was something that originated in Atlantean times and was not a disease of not enough inhibition. It was a disease of too much inhibition. It was from people trying to suppress the very things that had gotten them in trouble in Lemuria. The cancer is tied to suppressed, repressed emotions, according to esoterics. So let's go even further back now. Uh, there were previous root races, but they didn't even have dense physical form. There's not much we can say about them. They're so dissimilar to us. But esoteric says that there are 60 billion individuals in our humanity, that 24 billion of those became human in Lemuria, made the jump from the animal kingdom, had the consciousness transition from the animal kingdom of objective consciousness to not only objective consciousness, but self-consciousness. That's the dividing line between the animal and the human kingdom in the context of esoterics, which is all about the evolution of consciousness. So 24 billion of us are originated as humans there. Others came through other chains of, of planets to get here. Um, according to uh, Blavatsky, the moon is the, the skeleton, essentially, of a planet. It's the remains of a planet from which a great stream of humans came into this evolution. That between Mars and Jupiter is the remains of a planet as well, but shattered into all the asteroid belt. That the souls that had uh, individualized on that particular planet were transferred here at its destruction. And out of that 60 billion individuals, many of those are much more advanced than us. And it's not going to serve them to incarnate now they won't come in until the sixth or seventh root race, which is far in the distant future. Although some clans of those individuals do incarnate, just once again to help us, we occasionally get a clan that comes in and will try to be an elite that can help guide mankind because they've, they've, they've really gone so far ahead of us. You know, I, I, I'm not sure what to make of science's very firm conviction that the universe is 12 billion years old. And I don't know if they've got the math right or what, but when you read Blavatsky talking about 100 years of Brahma, as if that's a legitimate time frame in, in the universe's progress, 100 years of Brahma is 311 trillion, 40 billion years. <laughs> in the uh, old esoteric books, they try to illustrate these really long periods of time by the, by the idea, a teacher will say to a student, okay, just imagine, see that mountain there? Imagine that every hundred years, a dove flies across the top of the mountain carrying a handkerchief in its beak. As it flies over the mountain, the handkerchief brushes the highest point of the mountain. When the mountain is gone, <laughs> that's the time period we're talking about. <laughs> So now that we've gone all the way back, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the greater forces affecting history. You know, we've talked about the root races. That's a very powerful dynamic, you know. Humanity incarnating to achieve a particular goal. Um, the, the unfortunately co-opt name Aryan, as you find in the old books, is applied to the fifth root race. So don't get the wrong idea, just because it was hijacked by Hitler and his gang. The Aryan root race started about 100,000 years ago 
and its first sub-race, each, each root race has sub-race, the first one is um, the population of India, for the most part. And then on through different sub-races, the, the Celts, the Teutonic, you know, the Slavic. Another big factor is, as we mentioned, you have these clans of advanced souls that incarnate. Well, sometimes when it's time for a civilization to end, it's arranged that clans of barbarians incarnate into it. And a barbarian can be very intelligent. You know, they do things like run Enron. <laughs> the barbarian is actually not a mental category. It's a category of the degree to which you have progressed in understanding the unity of humanity and of refining your vehicles and acquiring the virtues of, of compassion and affection and admiration instead of the lower grade emotionality of um, you know, jealousy and anger, hatred and division. Mentality, there's plenty of individuals out there with overdeveloped mentalities and underdeveloped hearts really is one way to look at it, but emotionality is one way to look at it too. That they, they're in the repellent lower emotional fields rather than the attractive higher levels of emotionality. So, Barbarians can incarnate, uh, and in fact, at this particular time in history, between the zodiac, the, 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 the epic of um, Pisces and of uh, Aquarius, the zodiac epics, we're right at the cusp between the two. And it's a time of chaos, actually, when souls will incarnate, in, up, you know, very evolved souls will incarnate in the lowest classes of society. Barbarians will incarnate in the upper classes, and it serves to actually break down old structures and we're seeing a lot of that, you know? We're seeing great institutions being discredited thoroughly by the kind of people that are running them. And we see that even in our U.S. government where we have political leaders who are doing a fine job of convincing us we need to get better leadership. <laughs> so the levels of, 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 human, that are, of human progress are broken down into barbarian. And the barbarians have had a fine run, you know? We need, actually, chaotic times of human history so that the barbarians can come in and do what barbarians need to do to learn to get to the next level. You know, the invading hordes sweeping through Europe were barbarians doing what they needed to do to f learn about being barbarians. Let's hope that we're not going to give them too many more opportunities because we'd like to move on to at least the civilizational level of people, people that understand that without a few rules, without following some of the laws, and so without some kind of order, things really get unpleasant quickly. That's the civilizational level of human progress. The next, that we are only still aspiring to as a humanity, and for the most part as individuals, is the cultural. That's when we make the transition from the, the negative, you know, repellent emotional vibrations to the, to the positive, attractive emotional nature. Interesting byproduct of us reaching that cultural level, let's just hope we can do it soon, is that the the very powerful people who are operating at, from a selfish motives and pretty much run the planet in a lot of different ways, at least human um, institutions, they lose their power when we reach a cultural level because those very powerful individuals that are all just all about power, power, evil individuals really, they control through our lower natures. You know, they, they divide us through our, our willingness to um, <coughs> to treat non-Americans as inferior, you know? They, they can accentuate that and divide and conquer. It's always divide and conquer. If we are continually manipulated through our lowest passions, our, just our greed, you know, our desire for possessions, our, um, our, our pleasure seeking to disregard of everything else, to whatever degree they can keep us focused on that, they keep us from rising up to the cultural level. Once we reach the cultural level, we're not going to cooperate anymore. As a whole, humanity will no longer cooperate with the plans of people whose agenda is really a kind of slavery of humanity. We have too many powerful people for whom that's really what they're up to. Beyond cultural is the, the, kind of the level of humanity. And each of us goes through this on an individual basis as well as all of humanity. And of course, some of us are making the effort to move ahead quicker than the rest of humanity. And let's hope we can all reach that level 
called humanity because that's when we really realize our unity. And then the next level beyond that is actually where we only spend a few incarnations in this next level because it's the transition out of the human kingdom to the next kingdom of complete conscious unity with everything. Um, it's called ideality. And it's where you are very much aware of the inner intention of your own soul and cooperate with it or infused by that intention, basically, and no longer, um, you just, you're almost done being human at that point. So speaking of almost done being human, let's talk about this next level that we'd like to get to where we're, 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 we're conscious of, a, of our purpose in a, in a much deeper way. It's called being a causal self. It's the higher level of the mental world. We, we've all explored the lower levels, you know, the bookkeeping levels and the, the logical levels of associating this with that and deductive reasoning. And even gotten to a degree into principle thinking where we can think in terms of general principles. To get beyond that, we, we get into systemic thinking, be able to see whole systems. And we're starting to reach the higher levels of the mental there. And we'll discover through that systemic thinking, that's where we first find the unity of humanity, the ideal, uh, ideals of consciousness have been planted here long ago on those levels for us to find. It's, it's called a causal level, I think, and I'm not, I, I actually haven't traced the origin of the name down, but when you've reached that level, you acquire some new abilities. You acquire the ability to actually contact the matter that we're surrounded with or that we're made up of and read history through it. And people talk about this like the Akasha. It's really not quite the same thing. I'll talk about the Akasha in a little bit. But being a causal self is what I'm going to come back to as soon as I change the tape on the video camera. So brief break. <laughs> Krishnamurti, Alcyon. There was a, I knew there'd be a picture behind me somewhere of him. Really, a, we went to see him when I was a child. We'd go see him in, uh, in, in Crotona in Southern California. And I remember he's, he's just such a, he's a handsome guy. And at the time when I went to see him as a kid, he had long white hair. He's just the coolest looking guy. So. That's all I could register as an eight-year-old. He would start talking about things and I would be wandering on the grass shortly. <laughs> but. So, causal self. When we can come in touch with the actual atomic memory of things, we actually get to visit our own history. We get to have a look at all of our previous incarnations. And of course, by the time we reach there, let's hope that we're not, we're strong enough to look at those that it's not overwhelming and that we also don't get lost endlessly searching in the past because the past can be a huge distraction. What we really want to do is look into the past in order to see what we still need to straighten out in our own lives. I mean, we've, we've put certain causes in motion and we're going to, before we can make the jump to the next kingdom, we have to square every debt. And debt's the wrong word, but anything that's out of balance has got to get set straight. So, as Lawrence says, the history of the human individual exists in the collective memory of the, of the causal world. And the past becomes a different thing when, we're, when we become a causal self. When we can actually read any of it that we want, it's not such a mystery. We don't, certainly don't have to rely on historians, thank goodness. We can actually go see what really happened in any of the circumstances of the past. And every world has its stored memories too, it turns out. It, sometimes people get off on tangents with it. Like uh, what Lawrence says is that there, you know, the emotional world has its lower subplanes. And Steiner, for instance, was able to actually see the memories of the, those lower subplanes. But what you can see on those planes is not necessarily what really happened, but what people believed happened. So that led to some misunderstandings. When you're looking in the emotional world, you see what people believed, what they created out of their emotions and beliefs. It's not actually a depiction of what really happened. So, all matter, it's, it's, it says in, in Hylozoics, has, has perfect memory of everything that's ever happened to it. And we, according to Hylozoics, are in our essence a point of matter, the smallest possible point called a monad, 
and our, ourselves as monad that we don't get to really discover ourselves as monad until we've identified with a great series of bodies that allow us to relate to the worlds of all the cosmos. I mean, we have this world relating to through a body. There are many worlds beyond this. But once we finish that whole cycle, we finally know ourselves to be this one bit of matter and one bit of consciousness, but that one, it's not really a bit of consciousness. All consciousness is one. We're reminded comp uh, continually in this material. And we reach that point, we just share in all the consciousness. And long before that, we will have no, know the method to ascertain the history of anything we want to by contacting the atomic memory of the different worlds. The masters, the, that's one of the terms for the beings that are from the kingdom beyond ours, if they want to show you an event from the past, they can just put it in front of your mind's eye like a movie. And it's better than a movie because not only is a physical, I mean, a, a visual view of everything available, but the emotions that were felt at the time and the thoughts that were thought at the time are also recorded and can all be re-perceived again. So, no masters show me a movie like that, but I'm looking forward to, uh, <laughs> to that one of these days, I hope. Or at least getting my own abilities developed to the degree where I can go see things for myself. Deep in the roots of all of our worlds are archetypical ideas. That's another place where we, where we learn actually what's going on is we can get to much higher worlds where the very ideas of, of humanity and of the root races and everything are formed. But that's, that's looking way ahead for us. Speaking of looking ahead, in my next talk, it's actually going to be about those masters, about those beings that are called adepts or members of the White Lodge or White Brotherhood, or there's all kinds of, you know, that's probably, a, some of those names get a little tricky sometimes, but these are the beings that are for, graduated from the human kingdom. They've done all the work that it takes to get through, and this is a process of millions of years to go through the human kingdom. According to esoterics, 125,000 incarnations, 150 is, is quite common to get through the human kingdom, and it can be many more. We, it's up to us. We can take an unlimited number. We'll keep getting provided with new bodies as needed. But once we've finished that process, we make it to the next level, we, um, we are, are part of, well, you know, I talked about how we jump from the animal kingdom to the human kingdom through a consciousness development. The consciousness shift is from just objective consciousness to self-consciousness, you know, not just I'm going to get that squirrel to, <laughs> I'm Rover and I'm going to get that squirrel. You know, that's a big difference. So when you've got self-consciousness, what would you guess the next consciousness jump would be? Well, looking at where humanity is right now, it's not very obvious. We're not very close to it. <laughs> but the next one is collective consciousness. That's sharing consciousness. In the next kingdom, all the beings can share consciousness. And through that means you can know a great deal more than you could know through the isolated kind of human consciousness that we have now. It's another great thing to look forward to. And of course, there's no such thing as loneliness or misunderstanding when you can share consciousness, too. So those beings, in order to join that collective consciousness, they're not welcome to that collective consciousness while they're full of egotistic ideas about how they're going to use their power to make themselves famous and fabulous. <laughs> the collective conscious is not interested in sharing consciousness with somebody like that. That's kind of, that's actually a pretty disgusting atmosphere for a being that w operates on those high levels of unity and, and, and love. To have to come into humanity and deal with the gross, even, even clairvoyance described them as grossly muddy colors in people's auras that are muddied by their selfishness. That's not a very pleasant thing, but the, these beings from the next kingdom make great sacrifices to come and spend time with us anyway and try to give us some good information. There are, looking through history, you can see these beings in many threads through history, like Pythagoras is referred to in modern times, in the, in the theosophical times, as Kuthumi. He's the master that's behind the whole revelation of, of esoterics to humanity that began in 1875. You know, we lost our connection to these masters in Atlantis. We rejected them. We chose the wrong people. And we, we haven't gotten it back, but they have decided to give us some information. You know, they gave us 
starting in 1875 through Blavatsky and then Besant and Leadbeater and Alice Bailey and Lawrence, they who are providing information for us about how it all works. And they're providing it from perspective we simply can't have as human beings. There's no other way to get this information. And there's no way to verify it either as human beings. So we've just got to use it as a hypothesis to see maybe this makes sense. Maybe if I try living as if this was true, my life might change, you know, if there really is a, uh, you know, a higher being that's looking after my needs, maybe I can actually ask to get to know it. You'd be surprised what happens, perhaps, if you try. The Bailey books were written by the secretary of this organization, the, of, the, of, the, of the planetary hierarchy, it's called, the, the organization within the next kingdom that's trying to help the planet and help us. The secretary is Dwal Kuhl, who is, you see his, him go, throughout history, Clinus, a um, disciple of Pythagoras, Dharma Jyoti, a disciple of Buddha, Arya Sangha, the founder of the Yogi, Yogacara school of Buddhism, and is Confucius. And then working through Alice Bailey through, to create um, 20 volumes or so of the most incredible material. Um, you can see, uh, <laughs> and interesting in the Alice Bailey material, sometimes uh, Madame Blavatsky is referred to as he, because they, uh, DK, I think, is more used to working with him as Cagliostro, a previous incarnation in Europe, um, of Blavatsky, who, of course, has had other incarnations going back to, and then you can and read in Al Lives of Alcyone about these threads of these great beings' incarnations. Saint Germain, um, he was Proclos, the scholastic of Greek philosophy. Christian Rosenkreutz, founder of the original Rosicrucians, not the ones that exist now. Francis Bacon, who uh, was most likely Shakespeare. And Count Rakoczy, another figure in European history. He incarnated again and again in European history. Had a lot of influence. Uh, Lawrence, he praises Shakespeare pretty highly, by the way. He, said, he says that Shakespeare saw people as they really are, which is not something that people actually can do. And it really took a master to look from above, you know, and see the, see, see the forest instead of the trees. So as we, as we talk about these uh, beings and the worlds beyond ours, it's a vast topic and I'm only just touching on these things. I want to encourage you to look them up for yourself and, and the next talk I'm going to go into a lot more detail about these beings and about the next kingdom. That's going to be the particular focus of it. If that's of interest to you, please do come. Um, I realize it's, I'm providing no ground for, for this. And this is something that actually, Lawrence, says Westerners need. Eastern consciousness has a lot more devotional aspects devoted to a teacher. Westerners want a material basis. They want rationality behind it. They want something to build on. And Lawrence has provided this, I think, better than any of the other books that dispense information to people about these things. I think Lawrence is He's basing it all on a concrete basis of everything being made out of the monads, the smallest divisible unit of matter, that everything is, that comes, has a trinity of properties. There's matter, motion, consciousness. That everything really comes out of that. You can build the whole theory out, out of just that. So, speaking of history, let's get back to the present moment. We're making history right now. And we're recording it. You've seen the cameras in the back. The history of the times is being recorded in a new way. We've got something like a technological Akashic record going on right now with the internet and the vast amounts of storage that store your every phone call, as we have found out. <laughs> um, there are cameras pointed here, there, and everywhere, and all of that's getting stored. We have the ability to store all this information, and so it's really like a, a physical, technological copy of the Akashic Record, in, in a way. And we're making this video right now of this talk, and I have no idea how long that's going to persist in the cyberspace, and how many people it might be useful for, but um, it's a, going to be a part of history. It'll probably outlive me, I suppose. I don't know. 
All my previous talks are going to be up there soon too on the internet, uh, except for the very first two we didn't have recorded. But this one's about history. So I'd like to invite anybody who would like to be part of history to come stand up here with me and be on the video and be part of this historical moment. Show that you were here. This does not imply that you agree with anything I said. <laughs> but that's the conclusion of my talk is that some of us will be, somebody besides me is going to be visible in this piece of history. So please, I invite you to come up and, and make an appearance as part of history. <laughs> come on, all of you. <laughs> Alia, my daughter. <laughs> hey, Dave. <laughs> Valerie, come on up here and be a part of history. There we go. Nobody else wants to be part of this historic moment. <laughs> well, thank you for coming. I really appreciate your listening. You're participating by giving me the chance to talk. <laughs> and that's the end. Thank you. I'm going to, I'll stay up here for a while if you have any questions. Certainly, I'll try to answer any questions. Yeah. So, you're, okay, just to restate, because it's probably not recorded. Um, you're, you're saying that history, in a lot of cases, is rather scientifically prepared and, and reviewed and their evidence is found to back it, and there's a certain consensus that, yes, this probably did happen or didn't happen. I think that's relatively new, you know. Um, it's new to take that approach, and what that approach is drawing on is a lot of material that we're going to have to take on faith anyway, that somebody wrote something down and we don't, you know, where are the first-hand people that can give us that information? I think there's always a lot of room for doubt about whatever it is that the person is starting with as a description of history it's only really recently that we didn't have really powerful forces of religious groups in particular deciding what could be said, what was true, what history was going to be, or burn that, you know. So I, I, the, I think the point to what I was trying to make is there just isn't a lot to go on. It's, it, all this information is offered for you to do what you want with, really. I don't have... Um, personal experience or proof to offer with it. If it's, if it's offered in these books, it, my own way of, of considering whether it might be true or not is how well it dovetails with other things I know. Um, does, it, does it seem to be consistent, really? Consistency is one of the big things. I mean, if you, you can look at like the Bible or something, you've got things that dates don't even match up between prophets who talked to each other hundreds of years apart and weren't alive at the same time, and stuff like that. It dis dismisses itself, you know, through contradictions. But if you, you can find everything dovetails nicely and logically, then you might have something. And with this history, you know, the 64, 60 billion souls, of, I, don't, I don't know them all personally. I have no idea <laughs> <laughs> that there are that many. But, but this is consistent throughout the different teachings that come from a lot of different directions, at least. Lawrence C. and D.K. with the Alice Bailey books, they preface everything they say with, don't believe it because I said it. In fact, it shouldn't matter at all who says it. If it, information is useful to you, if you think that it may be uh, plausible to you and you try it on as a hypothesis, try as a theory, that's going to be the only proof you ever really get, is does it actually pan out when you yourself try to do something with it? Well, actually, we were just speculating on that earlier today. It could have, you know, you've got an ice age, you've got tremendous mass shifts from the poles to the oceans. That could have something to do with it, but Lawrence warns us not to speculate too much on things like that. Um, and it actually says in the books that it was an intentionally conscious act of the planetary government to end humanity, and it initiated the tilt to the Earth's axis. To, to, re to recap what you're saying, there are some bad trends. I mean, we see division of wealth that is accelerating, that with people suffering um, in, in this country where really we, we're, we're not looking out for each other very well. It's true. But if there were no chance for us to actually fix things up, it would be over. 
That was the situation in Atlantis. They had no more chance to actually overcome the government, the problems, the entrenched Black Lodge, and so it had to be destroyed. But as long as we're here, that means there's hope. And one of the books of uh, Alice Bailey's about history, she said World War II actually could have been prevented, and there was a huge effort underway to make that happen, but we didn't pull together enough unity in the Allied side of things. But it was dark, and it, but it, you know, it wasn't inevitable. There was, a, there was hope, and, and I'm sure there is hope now, because if there was no hope, it really would be, over, it'd be already too late. I mean, when it's too late, it, it's over. There's no inefficiency about the system. I want to redo a talk that I gave a while back about the great truths and the great lies, because I go into the nature of the beings, the, the bad people, basically, who are trying to run everything and what their plan is. Now. I mean, it's happening. Just the vision of uh, wealth the, is beyond belief. It, they, they have been running things for a long for time. For a long time. But despite that, we got this country created. They don't run everything. You know, this country the was not their product. The more they the more they will. Possibly. Possible hell, it's already happened. But the technology has to, this is the thing, you know, you read in the, in the, in the Bailey books, you got the, the, the hierarchy trying to guide humanity, lead us the right direction. You got the Black Lodge trying to hold humanity down into as low a level as possible so that we don't wake up and lose the ability to be controlled. But it's a continual battle, and both of them are always guessing what humanity is going to do next. When we have this internet suddenly appear, they're both going, well, can we use this for our benefit, or is it going to be helpful or hurtful? It's all very surprising. It's, you know, how long have we really had the internet out there? Less than 20 years we've been using this, and nobody quite knows what the event, end result of it's going to be. That's still a big wild card. Lawrence is out there, all this great material. Everybody can get at it now. That's a first. There's some hope there. Nice. Well, we're doing it. If the fact that we're here talking about this, you know, um, I know we have a meditation group in Port Townsend, and sometimes it comes up in the group, look at the mess in the world, what can we do about this? And then it, every time it hits us, wait a minute, we're doing something right now. <laughs> we're getting together, we're, we're establishing some unity. We, we, we say the great invocation. There are some very powerful things you can say to bring light and love in. That, you know, that invocation was given to us by the masters. When you, when you set up a, a group, or even your own personal meditations, when you really tune in and tune your mind to the right radio station, you know, the soul station, <laughs> then you're bringing in the energy that will change things, and you become part of the change. It's not for every one of us to go out there and pick at Monsanto, you know. <laughs> this, is, this is actually what I'm doing right now, it's talking about. That's, you know, everybody has something different to do, some different role to play. Raising children, well, that's a huge one. Nothing will change the planet faster than if everybody would raise their children with open minds and open hearts. That would change the planet overnight. In fact, parents are in great demand from the, in the discarnate side of things. You know, it's almost like a, a huge competition among the souls there to find parents that will you know, provide them the opportunity to grow up as, as clean-minded beings and not brutalized by childhood. But, you know, that, so that's one of the positive things, is that people can contribute in per very personal ways. And that, you know, the nice thing that you do for somebody may make all the difference. It, you know, we're all of us, all of us are on a bit of an edge, teetering either direction. I think it's a fine edge for humanity even right now. And, and it doesn't take much of a push when you're, you're balanced on a razor blade, you know? <laughs> I hope that's positive enough. <laughs> positive side. Yes. Let's get all push it over the positive side. <laughs> so that the Black Lodge is saying, dang it, it's too late. They've gone too far into the good. There's no way we're going <laughs> to. Because they will. It's inevitable. They lose the game eventually. You know, as soon as humanity wakes up enough and reaches the cultural level, the power control beings are left powerless. It's, it is inevitable. And we get as many tries as we need to get it done, too. Just like as individuals of many incarnations, humanity gets as many incarnations as humanity needs to overcome its challenges. It is inevitable. And Patanjali calls it the rain cloud of knowable things. When you really contact the higher mental world, there's so much information for us. 
And now if one person brings it down, they can share it with the entire planet on the internet. So maybe we can get a lot more really good truth out there more quickly. <laughs> if, if, as we have been told, the, the next big step for us to get to the next kingdom is moving to collective consciousness. Look at this collective information sharing. It's just a big symbol of it. And humanity, I, I actually meant to mention this in the talk, but humanity has, knows a lot more than we have yet rediscovered. Lawrence says that astrology was a science that Chaldeans of 30 years ago mastered completely. And because it, it's part of humanity's heritage. And as soon as some of those Chaldeans come reincarnate again, we'll get the whole scoop on astrology again. <laughs> what? 30 years ago. Let's say 30,000 is what I meant to say. 30,000 years ago. Sorry. 30 years ago. 30,000. 30, you can bet when they do come back, they'll put it on the internet. Let's hope. 